I think this is the time. This is the moment for you to begin to move now. Begin to move now. There's a window right now. There's a window right now. And you and I keep making excuses to make it later, 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 later. And you've been waiting two years, three years, five years, seven years. And you keep going later, later, later. No, the time is now. Go up now. Go up now. Veterans, go up now. Single people, go up now. Teenagers, go up now. Married people, go up now. Older people, go up now. Younger people, go up now. Go up now. And stop waiting for everything to be perfect before you go. Go up now. Go up now. Go up now. I know I'm even fighting with, I can, I can hear you in your own head. I'm saying it over and over and over again, hopefully being an, extensions of, uh, an extension of God's voice into your heart and your mind. Stop making all those excuses. Go up now. If you have your Bibles, they'll open them up somewhere, and we're going to jump into the scriptures here. First Samuel chapter 9 is where we're going to go, and we're going to dig back into something that we looked at a number of months ago. So if you're looking for a title, I don't know if I have an official title yet, but we're going to be in a series I'm going to call Looking for a Leader, the Remix. Uh, looking for a Leader, the the remix here, First Samuel chapter 9. If you did not bring your Bible, we're going to put the verses on the screen so you can follow along with us. We're going to begin reading in verse number 3. It says, Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father Kish were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Shalisha, but they did not find them. They went on into the district of Shalim, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. A uh, little context, if you read the first couple of verses here, uh, you'll discover that this guy Kish uh, is a very wealthy man, influential. He has this son named Saul, and Saul, the Bible tells us, is tall and handsome, like, thank you, honey. Uh, I left it open there, seeing if I could get an amen from my bride. So good job, honey. Threw that up, alley-oop, threw it down. So here, here is this guy. He's tall. He's handsome. He's from an influential family. Uh, he's got a lot of prominence. His dad's donkeys are lost. The dad sends him out and he sends his servant out and says, hey, go find the donkeys. They're on their way out there going to look for the donkeys. And then there's a bunch of names that we kind of have a hard time uh, uh, reading and understanding. Ephraim and Shalim and these different places. He's going from place to place, north, south, east east and west, trying to find these donkeys. He cannot find them anywhere. He is looking all over the place. The name Ephraim actually means fruitful. Uh, some of these other names, we're not sure what they mean. One of them we think could mean cave or it could mean place of foxes. We're not sure exactly what they mean, but what we do know is he and the servant are wandering around and they cannot find what they are looking for. They're lost. They do not know where these donkeys are. This may be how you feel. Wandering. Just trying to figure out what is going on with my life. Where am I? Am I on course? Am I off course? Am I, am I where God wants me to be? Or am I not where God wants me to be? I, I, I'm frustrated I've been sent out that they're telling me I have a purpose. What's my purpose? 
Why am I put, why was I put here on this planet? Why, why does God even have me here? It seems like they know their purpose. It seems like they're able to fulfill the, their reason for being on the earth. It seems they know their destiny. Why does everybody else seem so sure and I seem so confused? Now, if you have not felt this at all, God bless you, okay? You're in the minority. <laughs> Most of us, most of us, whether it's in our 20s, in our 30s, in our 40s, and shoot, dare I even say, maybe when you get up into your 60s or 70s and 80s, can still sometimes be wrestling and wondering, am I going the right way? Am I on the right path? Have I gotten off course? Am I wasting my time? Because I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to just wander. I don't want to just exist. I want to fulfill the plan and purpose that God has for my life. And here is Saul and the servant, and they're just wandering around, and they have no idea if they're in the right spot. So look at this next verse. Look at this next one. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 9, uh, get down to verse uh, number 5. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back. My father will stop thinking about the donkey, donkeys and start worrying about us. He says, and this is, this is a question that a lot of us are asking even right now. Should I keep going? Should I keep going? Like, should I keep putting one foot in front of the other? Like in this job, should I keep going? Some are asking this question about their marriage. Should I keep going? Some are asking this question about their career. Should I keep going? I've been wandering around for a while. I've been looking around for a while. I've been, I've been going from place to place to place. Should I keep going? Like I've invested a lot of energy here. I've given a lot of money. I've gone to a lot of seminars. I got the certifications. I went to school. Should I keep going? How about when you've been from counselor to counselor? You're going from church to church. And now you're wondering, have I wasted my time? Should I keep moving forward here? Or should I throw in the towel? I, I, I don't know if I can answer the question specifically for every one of us, but what I have found, what I have found is you answering this question has a lot to do with what you're looking for and who you're looking with, okay? What you're looking for. He's, these aren't his sheep, he's, his donkeys. They belong to his father. They're not his. So when it's not yours, sometimes it's a little bit easier to throw in the towel. Parents ever ask your kids to clean their room? And all of a sudden, they have no power in their legs? Oh, oh, clean my room. Oh, their, their hands go limp. Their, their neck doesn't work. They're, you know, I'm so tired. I'm so, I'm so tired. You're nine. You're not tired, okay? You don't have any bills. You're not tired, okay? Uh, I'm so tired. Oh, I'm so tired. Wait, you just were running around three seconds ago. No, but now, oh, now, now, I can't believe you asked me to do this. Oh, my, who, who dirtied the room? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. No, you know. It was you. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. And then, like a bad parent, like all of us are at times, we say, hey, how about we go get some ice cream? after you clean your room. And all of a sudden, the power of the Holy Spirit <laughs> comes upon that child and they have the strength of Samson and can all of a sudden do things they could, they could not do before. Legs are strong, arms are strong, neck working again. Wow! Why? Ownership ownership. It does something to you. It does something when it's yours. 
It does something when it belongs to you. It does something when you have not disconnected yourself from it, but now it's a part of who you are. Some of us, it might be easier for us to get rid of our spouse because we have now disconnected ourselves from them emotionally, sexually, financially, mentally. So since we're disconnected, we don't feel like they, that's us anymore. And now since they don't belong to us, it might be easier to disregard and set them aside. But when there is ownership, not in some weird funky way, but in a healthy, godly way that you are the one that God brought into my life, that we are one flesh, that no weapon formed against us can prosper. And yes, it's been hard, but the answer, should I keep going? The answer is yes, because you're mine and I'm yours. Should I keep going? 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 I don't know if I should keep going. God, give me a sign. God, give me a sign. God, give me a sign. And then he sent you to a church with a guy wearing a random sweater and camo pants. Should I, should I keep going? And the guy is saying, yeah, I think you should. I think you should not throw in the towel. I think God still has more in the bank. I think God still wants to use your life for his glory. I think you shouldn't give up on church yet. I think you shouldn't give up on people yet. I don't think you should give up on your call yet. I don't think you should give up on your destiny yet. I don't think you should give up on your parents yet. I don't think you should give up on what God wants to do in and through your life. Should I keep going? Yes. Keep on going here. Put one foot in front of the other and believe God for the strength that can only come from him. Should I keep going? Do you own it? Do you own it? Do you own it? Do you own it? And who are you with? Who's talking to you? Who's talking to you? Who's talking to you? Who's in your ear? Who's in your ear? If you've been hurt by church like all of us have, can I get an amen? amen. Come on. If you've been hurt, if you're just around a bunch of other hurt people, I'm telling you, sometimes they'll tell oh, don't do church. You don't need Jesus. You, know, you can love Jesus and you don't need the church, let alone that the church is Jesus' bride. But you talk to enough people. Oh, you better not. You see, you see this on TV. You see that on TV. So you can't trust none of them. We can't trust you. You're the church. Look how jacked up you are. Stop acting like you ain't messed up. Now, obviously, there's some crazy abuses, some wild things out there. I'm not, I'm not at all saying, hey, let's go ahead and cover up that stuff. I'm just saying the church has been jacked up for a really long time. Y'all. Should I keep going? Yes, you should keep going. You get the wrong people in your ear, though. They'll try to disconnect you from community, get you out on an island, and you've all seen National Geographic. That's when the lion comes after that little wildebeest. <laughs> out there by the little lonesome self, just lick Mm, this water is good. You're dead, boy. You're dead. <laughs> Should I keep going? Who's talking to you? Who's talk- what do your parents say? I know some of y'all, you're first generation Christians. Nobody in your family follows Jesus. They're like, hey, we're Catholic. You're like, well, I mean, it's still Jesus. No, no, no. What are you doing? Why are you going to that church? We don't do church. Parents talking to you, talking to you. What, what, what are you part of here? What are you, what are you doing? These are the wrong people talking to you. They'll try to disconnect you. Should you keep going? Should you keep going? Why are you giving that time? Why are you giving that money? Why are you giving, why are you giving your gifts and talent? What are you doing? You better stop. You get the wrong people talking to you. They'll get you off of your purpose and your destiny. This happened. This Jesus, Jesus even had this moment where he asked, should I keep going? We talked about this a number of months ago. You might remember that message we did called the Garden Club. We had that, all that beautiful garden uh, up here. Matter of fact, this flower is from that garden. <laughs> It was up here, and we talked about how Jesus was in the garden. He, he was redeeming the garden because Adam had messed up in the garden in Genesis. Now Jesus is bringing the garden. He, he's redeeming what, what Adam had messed up and in the garden. You can read this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Put it on the screen here. Jesus is in the garden, and he's saying, Hey, Lord, I love for this thing to go another way. Is, is there another way? Can you take this cup from me? Then he says, nah, nah, Lord, not my will. Your will be done. Not my will, 
Your will be done. Not my will. Your will be done. I don't know what brand of Christianity we have been trying to live where we think we get to pray, God, not your will, my will be done. God, not what you want, what I want. God, don't you know my needs? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know where uh, all I've sacrificed? Don't you know, God, not your will, my will be done. And I'm telling you, Jesus here gives us the right blueprint that should be the prayer of every single follower of Jesus. It's not my will anymore. God, I want your will. I don't want to go my way. I want to go your way. I'm wondering, Shoreline City, if we can have such a soul transformation, something happen on the inside of us where we would not live some cultural Christianity, but we live a biblical Christianity centered around the person of Jesus that we would symbolically or even literally get on our knees and say, God, I don't want my own way anymore. I want your way. I know the dreams I have for my life. I know the things people have said I should do, but God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to give? What do you want me to sacrifice? God, I don't want the idols of this world anymore. I don't want anything else to be on the throne of my heart. What I want more than anything? While I'm a teenager, I'm single, I'm married, blended family, I don't care what your story is. The prayer can be the same. Not my will, but your will be done, oh God. I have found, I have found that we get so, we get so in our feelings, we start thinking that God owes us something. We get so in our feelings, we think somehow God is indebted to us. So we want to hold on to offense, want to hold on to our pride, want to hold on to the bottle, want to hold on to the pornography, want to hold on to the sexual immorality, want to hold on to the fear, want to hold on to the doubt, because I need this in order to survive. What you need to survive is not all the brokenness and not all the sins of this world my friends what we need to survive is the grace of almighty God the mercy that flows from that old rugged cross the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins and makes us do what we need to survive is the spirit of God filling us up from the top of our head to the soles of our feet what we need to survive is God filling us up with his power God not my will your will be done your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. Why are you playing games? Why are you playing games with your demons? Why are you just, why are you, why are you toying with the demons? Why are you just playing with them? Just playing with them. Playing, oh, this, this is not that bad. This won't mess me up all that much. We already talked. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The, the end of this is not life for you. The end of this is death for you. But, but in Jesus, yeah, it might start with death, but it ends with life. Yes, when you pick up that cross, you die. But my friends, you don't stay in the grave. You come back up, raised to new life, found in him, new in him, clothed in him, secure in him. Who is talking to you? What are they saying to you? What are you, what are you saying to yourself? What, what, what's in your ear? What are you saying to yourself? I have found that my self-talk has sabotaged me so many times. I, I have found, I have found that when, when I am, when I'm in a spot and I, I'm just not thinking correctly, I feel like I... It's not even the voices on the outside that mess me up. It's my voice on the inside that messes me up. I, 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 I wrestle with the insecurities and the fears and doubts. And maybe you do too. Maybe you find yourself second-guessing yourself, wondering if you're good enough I don't know if that I would say that we're good enough. I would say that God is good enough and his good enough covers all of our bad enough. So you are now new in him. So you don't have to worry about whether you're good or bad enough. Because it all flows by grace anyway. I mean, let, me look, let me show you this one other verse. Uh, uh, this is Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. Real quick, real quick, real quick. Oh, verse number, verse number 21, look at this, verse number 21. Who's talking to you? Who's talking to you? This is not just self-talk. Now this is the people around you. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, watch this, 
and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the, uh, and the te teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. He's telling them this, y'all. This is what's going to happen. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> never, Lord, you shut your mouth. This shall never happen to you. And look at Jesus' response. This is your sweet Jesus. Watch. Here's your sweet Jesus. You ready? Here's your sweet Jesus. Oh, gee, I love Jesus. He's so sweet. Okay, watch, watch, watch. Jesus turned and said to your boy, <laughs> get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The people that are in your ear, what do they have in mind? Do they have in mind the things that concern God? Or do they have in mind merely human concerns? When uh, Peter is looking at Jesus, he's like, no, nah, man, you're my ticket out of here. These Romans are, been, had their foot on our necks for so long. We're needing somebody to come in here and make things right. You can't go dying on me. <laughs> and Jesus says, you're not seeing this correctly. You're thinking temporary. I'm thinking eternal. Who is in your ear? This is why we talk about connect groups here all the time. This is why we're trying to make sure we're in community, surrounded by some people that are trying to go the same direction as you. Not perfect people, but just people trying to go the same direction as you. So at least you have somebody in your life saying, hey, 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 did you pray about this? Did you, did you talk to God at all? Uh, have, you, have you read the scriptures at all? Have you paused? Have you ever thought about praying and fasting about this? Do you have any leaders in your life that you submitted yourself to? You, you got to have some people around you that are saying to you the things that you need to hear so you fulfill the plan and purpose that God has on your life. Go back with me, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel. Okay, we're just walking through the text here. Just walking through the text. Go to, go to verse number six. But the servant replied, look, because again, uh, uh, Saul is thinking, I probably need to stop. Let's go back. But the servant replied, look, in this town there is a man of God. And he is highly respected. And everything he says come, comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. I was looking at this. This real, real quick, okay? Um, the son, Saul, is willing to stop. The servant says, I think we should keep going. I don't know the exact reason, but I wonder if this is a reason. Maybe, as a son, you have a different perspective than you do as a servant. As a son, you can go home and say, Dad, <laughs> dang, man, I looked for a minute. <laughs> I didn't see it, Dad. <laughs> Dad, I'm hot. Dad, I'm tired. Dad, I need some water. Dad, Mom, Mom missed me, okay? Mom missed me. I knew she missed me. I had to come back, Dad. So we'll find those donkeys. Dad, you're rich. You can get some of the donkeys, Dad. All right, we good? <laughs> Give me, come here, Dad. We good. As a son, you could probably do that. As a servant, you go, I ain't going back empty-handed. <laughs> As a servant, you're like, if I show up empty-handed, he might have my behind. <laughs> if I show up empty-handed, I might die. I might lose my job. As a servant, I got to make sure. So they have, they're working on the same thing but they have different perspectives. As a son, maybe Saul was just super secure. But maybe as a servant, he just felt like, no, I better stay on this grind a little bit longer. And I was thinking about us. And I thought, huh, we're sons and daughters, but we're also servants. So we're both of these things. Now, first, first, you're not a servant. First, you're a son or a daughter. That's first. 
And if you don't understand that son or daughter thing, then you got to start there. You got to understand the spirit of adoption. You got to understand that you were not saved because of how good you were. You were saved because of how good God is. It's by grace through faith in Jesus that we are made right. And you cannot earn your way to God at all. Not only can you not earn your way to God, do you know you cannot lose your salvation based on your works? You did not get your salvation through works. You can't lose your salvation through works so you got to understand you got to be secure steadfast strong I'm a son and a daughter of almighty God but then because of that grace that we have received let us not lose sight of the fact that we better keep some servant mindset on the inside of us, that we keep some grittiness so we're willing to keep on fighting and keep on pushing when other people want to quit. What I found is sometimes you can have somebody who's rich and they're lazy. Has the grace of God, have you allowed it to make you lazy? Has his forgiveness, have you allowed his forgiveness to make you lazy? Have you allowed his mercy to make you lazy? Oh, I don't have to earn my way to God, so I ain't got to do nothing. Huh. Do you think that's why Jesus died? He gave you all this forgiveness and this love so you could sit on your hands and you can just coast through life, not making a difference for his cause and his glory. No, my friends, he did not die for you and I just to sit back and do nothing. He died so that you and I would step into the plan and purpose that he has for us and we would fulfill his, his name, his glory in our generation. So I was wondering, for those of us who still have some grittiness, don't lose it. Those of us who still have some dirt underneath our nails, don't lose it. Those of us who are still willing to keep on fighting and stay on our knees and keep on praying and keep on going, don't lose it. I actually wrote it down like this. May the gift of grace inspire grittiness and not stinginess. May the gift of grace in our lives inspire grittiness and not stinginess. May we not try to hold things back, but instead would we have a fire on the inside of us that would, we would live for God's glory. I'm hoping something's clicking on the inside of you. I'm hoping you're waking up. I'm hoping we as a church are not just trying to have good Sundays, but we understand that we've been put on this earth to make it on earth as it is in heaven. I'm hoping you're beginning to understand that we're kingdom people. I hope that we understand that we are eternity-minded people, not temporary-minded people. I'm hoping we begin to understand that it's not just about our bills that we have to pay. And yes, we want them to be paid, but we also are about God, you doing all you want to do in my life and through my life. God, use me for your glory. Okay, go, go with me. Here, let's keep on walking. Keep on walking. Keep on walking. Uh, 1 Samuel ooh, number, verse number okay, go seven. Go seven. Saul said to the servant, if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? Saul said to his servant, I'm sorry, uh, verse number eight. The servant answered him again. Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. First, let me tell you, uh, Saul is thinking, I cannot go to the man of God empty-handed. I need to have something to give him. This is interesting, okay? I want to pause for a second. Because I read this and I'm like, huh. Well, I know God's not endorsing fortune telling because that's not biblical. Matter of fact, if you ever driving down the road and you see like, oh, tarot card reading, don't go in there. Okay? Demons all up in there. That's not where you need to go. All right? So this is not, I know, some fortune telling because God does not endorse that. So why would Saul think to bring a gift? Was there some prosperity preacher that told him? Ooh, you ain't going to hear from God unless you bring him a gift. No, there's no problem. This is before all that. <laughs> this is before some churches or politicians or preachers could, could distort God's word. This is before that. So now, what do we do? 
Because Saul here is thinking, I ought to have something in my hand. I ought to have a gift to bring this man of God. I was trying to figure this out. Why would he do this? Well, I'm thinking about us. You know when a little new baby is born? You bring a gift. The baby can't do anything for you except poop, sleep. <laughs> but you bring a gift. Um, our, our, our oldest son just graduated high school uh, last week. Matter of fact, shout out to all the graduates. Let's give it up for all the graduates. High school, college graduates, well done. Uh, um, people brought gifts. Why are they bringing gifts? What they're saying is, I honor you. I honor you. And here I think Saul is saying, and if he's not, he ought to be saying, I honor you. Jesus said it this way, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And many of us have disconnected our walk with God from us bringing our gifts, whether financial or even our talents, because we think God doesn't need that. No, he does not need it. You need to give it. Because what you do when you give it is you place honor and value on a gift that God is giving you. So for my wife and I, we do this. You know, we talk about like tithing and stuff here at the church, like, you know, the first 10%, like, oh my goodness, just so you know, 10% ain't enough. I give 100% of my money to God. Is that enough? All he's done for me? You're telling me all the grace he's given me. Here's my check, Lord. We're good. No. I'm giving this to say, God, thank you for being so kind and gracious to me. I honor all that you have poured into my life. Some of us are not honoring God. And this is part of the reason your relationship with him is clunky. Because you disconnected this part of your life from your relationship with him. No guilt, no shame. Don't let guilt be your motivator. Let honor be your motivator. And as you honor God, you watch what he does in your heart and in your life. Okay, I'm almost done here. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Let's keep, let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. Y'all, this making sense? Okay, uh, verse 13. Okay, go to verse 13. He sees some girls. Some girls talk to him. The girls tell him where to go. And this is the girls telling him where to go, okay? The lady's telling him where to go. As soon as you enter the town... You will find him, talking about Samuel, you will find the prophet. You will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Go up now. Everybody say, go up now. Go up now. Say it again. Go up now. Go up now. You should find him about this time. Go up now. You should find him about this time. Go up now. You should find him about this time. Go up now. You should find him about this time. Go up now. You should find him about this time. He's saying there's a window. These ladies, their wives are saying there's a window. There's a window here. If you go up now, if you came up, if you came up yesterday, you would miss him. If you come up two days from now, you would miss him. There's a window. There's a window. If you go up now, you go up now, go up now. You should find him. Go up now, you should find him. Go up now, you should find him. Go up now. Like, don't, don't just wait. I think it's now. I think the time is now for you to go up to find him. Not later, now. Oh, man, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we should adopt. I, I'm just telling you, now. I think God is saying, now. Stop waiting. I got to get some things in order first. I got, I'm not, I'm not going to start. I'm not going to join the church until I feel like I'm in a better place. No, I'm, I'm saying don't, don't do that. I, I, think, I think you should go up now. I think you should go up now. I, I don't know if I can go to a connect group just yet because 
I'm still working through something. No, 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 no. Go up now. Go up now. Don't wait for later. You got to go up now. Don't go. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not old enough yet. Go up now. Well, right now, my marriage is not where I want it to be. So I'm just going to, no, no, no. Go up now. Go up now. I think this is the time. This is the moment for you to begin to move now. Begin to move now. There's a window right now. There's a window right now. And you and I keep making excuses to make it later, 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 later. And you've been waiting two years, three years, five years, seven years. And you keep going later, later, later. No, the time is now. Go up now. Go up now. Veterans, go up now. Single people, go up now. Teenagers, go up now. Married people, go up now. Older people, go up now. Younger people, go up now. Go up now. And stop waiting for everything to be perfect before you go. Go up now. Go up now. Go up now. I know I'm even fighting with, I can, I can hear you in your own head. I'm saying it over and over and over again, hopefully being an extension of, uh, an extension of God's voice into your heart and your mind. Stop making all those excuses. Go up now. You should find him about this time. He gets up there. He gets up there. Okay? Look at this. Verse number, ooh, I think I'm at 23. He gets there to the prophet. And the prophet's name is Samuel. Saul is the one that's been searching. So Samuel said to the cook, bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. Verse 24, so the cook took up the thigh with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it was set aside for you for this occasion. From the time I said, I have invited guests. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. Look at me, everybody online, everybody in this room. I have here, I have two, two plate options. I got those who love God, carnivore. And those who need to repent of their sins, vegetarian. Okay, I got both. <laughs> if you're a vegetarian, the Lord still loves you, okay? There's something wrong with you, though. No, 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 that's not, that's not. That's not. This is the way it's supposed to be. I got two options, two options, okay? He's searching and wandering. And now the prophet says, bring what was set aside. Meaning before Saul got there, something was being cooked up for him. He's wandering and almost quits. He almost quit. And if he would have quit, he never would have received what was set aside for him. But because he had the right person in his life who was speaking to him, he did not quit. And he made his way to the table. And all of a sudden, he is sitting there. And he's like, what? You're telling me? Not only do you, the prophet, know my name, but you are preparing for me. Can I just tell you right now that this is such a beautiful picture of the grace that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord? That even while you and I were wandering in our sin and in our trespasses, wandering in confusion, here was Jesus setting the table for us, saying, Son and daughter, would you please come and sit and would you eat? I have something for you. 
Some of us have been used to other people eating. You have been used to, and it makes sense in your mind that God would set something aside for somebody else. It makes sense in your mind that he would work in another marriage. It makes sense in your mind that he would work in another single person. It makes sense in your mind that he would work in another business, but you keep telling yourself, hey, he will not do that for me. And I'm just telling you, I dare to say that there's already a plate set aside for you and you're actually already at the table. My question is, are you going to sit and eat? Or are you going to sit and stare? I can't eat that. That's too good. Oh, Lord, I don't need all that. Give it to somebody else as if we're so holy. God, you've obviously gone abo above and beyond on this one. You bless me too much. I don't need that, Lord. I'm just a, why do you think it's about you? Why do you think that what he's trying to bless you with is just about you? What if, what if you need all the energy that's in that meal so that you can keep on running, so you can reach some people that are not yet reached? Why, why, what if it's not just about you? Oh, Lord, don't give me any more. Oh, Lord, my marriage is good enough. Oh, Lord, I don't need any more finances. You've been kind enough to me. I'll just stare. Sit and eat. Eat. He set it aside for you. Because he loves you. Because you're his son and daughter. Because he considered you. Because he's for you. decided church family and I, I have stared for a lot of my life to other people it might look like I'm eating but I know I know I've stared and you know because you're gifted enough and you're talented enough for other people to think you're eating but inside you're holding back you're on a leash. And I felt God say, he told me to tell you, he's looking for a leader. And you're it. You're it. Just stop waiting for it to be perfect, husband. I don't know how to lead my family. Stop waiting for it to be perfect, wife. I don't know how to be a leader in my... No, 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 no. Eat. Eat. Stop staring, single person. Stop staring, entrepreneur. Stop staring, business leader. Eat what God has set aside for you. Because it's not just about you. It's about what he wants to do in you and through you for his glory. If you wouldn't mind, bow your heads for just a moment. Online family in the room, just bow your heads for just a moment. If you're under the sound of my voice. And you've never given your heart and your life to Christ. You've never made him first. You've never made him number one. You've never made Jesus the boss of your life. You've never made him the ruler of your life. This is your moment to surrender. The Bible uses the word repent, to turn, have a mind change, to go from going your way to going Christ's way. If you are a follower of Jesus in here, this is your time to be praying for those in the room and online who are not. If you're under the sound of my voice, you've never given your heart and your life to Christ. At one point in time, you did. You slipped away. And today, you're saying, I don't want to go my own way. I want to go his way. On the count of three, I want you to do something simple but something bold. I just want you to throw your hand in the air and say, yes, that's me. I want to give my heart and my life to Christ. Ready? One, two, three. Just put your hand up in the air. Yep, we got friends all over this place at the balcony on the floor. Come on, online family saying, yep, that's me. That's me. That's me. I'm not going my own way anymore. I'm going his way. I'm going to ask everyone to do me a favor. Put your hand over your heart if you would not mind. And I want everyone to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me 
of all my sins. I admit I made mistakes. And today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Give me the power to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we lift our heads, clap our hands? Come on, church family.